you had a good lunch. Good, good. I, I want to just take a few moments and thank you for your hospitality today. It's been a great pleasure to be with you. We've been together in the past, and I always cherish the times that we have together, cherish the times that I get to spend with uh, Ken and Julie and his family. It's good to see his kids uh, this time, so it's, it's always good to be here. And uh, we're talking about spiritual warfare. And in talking about spiritual warfare, we've tried to uh, stress the point that even though we may not recognize it, we're at war. And uh, I think if we haven't accomplished anything else today, if we've just got us to wake up to the fact that we are in a battle, and I haven't necessarily mentioned this, but I believe this uh, opening slide kind of captures the entire theme of what we're talking about. We, we, uh, we are facing giants uh, out there. Uh, they are all around us. But we don't need to be intimidated because God is on our side. And if God is on our side, it doesn't matter the size of the person or whatever it is that we're fighting against, that with God on our side, we're going to have the ability to win that battle. And I love David's attitude when he fought Goliath. And I, and I don't know uh, the reason why, but when you look at the account of David and his battle against Goliath, you find that uh, when he goes out and he takes his sling to uh, fight Goliath, he picks up five stones. And if I understand right, uh, there were five brothers, Goliath and his four brothers, all of them giants. I, I don't know if David said, well, if his brothers come, I'm ready too. I, I don't know what was going on when he picked up those five rocks. We know he just needed one. And he took that one stone and he was able to defeat an enemy that the children of God were, were frightened of. And so we are in a battle, but we don't need to be afraid as we've already studied. And we've already looked at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12, and we've looked at the context behind it, and we understand that we are battling a great adversary. And what I want to do this evening or this afternoon is talk more about this adversary. I do remind us, as we've already said, that we are at war, whether we recognize it or not, we use the headline from December the 7th, or actually this is from December the 8th. If you look at the headline up there, this was the paper on Monday morning. The attack was on Sunday morning. And so uh, we pointed out that on Saturday night, people were living their life just like they always had and never realized that we were, with, we were at war. Same thing happened on September the 11th, 2001. Our nation had been under attack. There had been plans that had been laid, uh, schemes that had been drawn up, and the enemy was working from their pattern, and we were sitting back, and we didn't even realize that this was about to happen. And so we must be aware of the tricks that Dayton, uh, Satan is going to throw at us. Now, these are review, and I know some of you weren't here, so some of you, most of you were, so this is going to be a little bit of a review of what we talked about, but we're talking about things like Deuteronomy 29, 29, where the Bible tells us that secret things belong unto God, and we pointed out that some of the information about our spiritual warfare has been concealed by God. I don't know all the details of that. I wish sometimes we had more details about this, but we do know this, that even in our military, there's a need to know policy that has been put in place, and God revealed those things that we need. And those things that are not revealed, brethren, we don't need them. And if we needed them, God would have given them to us. So in this great battle, God has the plan laid out, and it's up to us to work the plan. So we want to talk more about our adversary, the devil. And uh, this is in a realm, brethren, that is unseen by human eyes. This realm that we're discussing, this uh, being that we're describing, is not seen by human eyes. But I want you to understand, even though we can't see the devil, he is real. He is not just this idea of an evil influence. 
He's not this idea that we see so many times uh, presented where you've got the devil and he's in a red suit and he's got horns and he's got a, a pitched fork in his hand and a, a tail with a spike on the end of it and, and he's walking around. I don't know about you, but if I saw that rascal walking toward me looking like that, I'm going to recognize him for who he is, right? I, I'm going to say, oh, I, I've seen that picture before. I know who that is. But guess what? That's not the way the Bible describes the devil. The Bible does not give us that description of the devil. And so we're talking about things that we're not going to be able to see with our human eyes. And I want you to notice a statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you would, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're not going to go into the detail. I, I like to uh, talk about detail uh, most of the time to set a little bit of the context. We're not going to do that this evening. But I want you to notice verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Now what that is saying is, brethren, there are things going on that we can't see. There are principles that are out there that we don't have the ability to see. And so we walk by the Word of God and not by what we see around us. The child of God looks at the world right now. And by the way, if you're on Facebook, I, I, I get totally uh, frustrated with brethren who act like because of the political climate that we're in, that somehow the devil's winning the battle. Well, brethren, that's not true. It's simply not true. And when we present an attitude of fear in front of the world, you know what they say in the military? Fear is contagious. And if one person is afraid, then it ripples through the entire army. And brethren, if we're afraid, it's going to ripple through the Lord's army. So we don't need to be afraid. But I want us to understand, brethren, Satan is real. He is a real being. He exists. We don't know the details of his uh, how he came into being. We can look at some verses and draw some conclusions, but you cannot go to a Bible verse and the Bible verse says, here is the origin of our enemy, Satan. We just don't have that. I wish we did, but we don't. But even if we don't have that, brethren, I know that Satan is real. I know this. There are angelic beings, and when I'm talking about angelic beings, I'm using it in the sense that we usually understand it. Celestial beings, they are real. We don't know all that angels have done in the past. We don't know what angels are doing right now. At least, I'm not aware of all the activity of angels. I don't know where I could go to a verse and tell, well, I know this in Luke 16, when a child of God dies, the angels carry that spirit to Abraham's bosom. But what else are they doing? Well, I, I don't know. I also know this. Demons are real. Now, I want to explain before you get upset with that. I'm not saying that we have demonic possession like they did in the first century and prior to that. I realize that because of the unfolding of the scheme of God, that God in His infinite wisdom allowed in certain times in the past for demons to actually possess human bodies. They, they would come in and take over a human being. That age has passed. We don't have demonic possession like that today. The reason I know that is because if demons had that same power today, then we would have the miraculous ability to cast them out and do those kinds of things. So when the age of the miraculous ended in the first century, when that ended, then demonic possession in that sense ended. But I want you to think about this. 
And this is important in this study. If I feed my mind on God, on the Word of God, on spiritual things, can I become, and I, I want you to notice the language that I'm using, can I become God-possessed? Can I become, as Peter would say, a partaker of the divine nature? Can I be like God? Well, we would have to say yes. We would have to say that if I spend my time dwelling on God, dwelling on His Word, dwelling on spiritual things, then we would realize I'm going to be filled with God. Well, brethren, the flip side of that is true as well. If I fill my mind with images and videos of murder and rape and lust and greed and I spend all my time feeding my brain that, then I can become possessed. And we look around our society today and we see it. And we see people that have allowed. Now, this is a choice that they have made. They have allowed themselves to be so filled with, I would say, satanic things that they have become possessed in that sense. This was not broadcasted for the open public. But when this man shot up the church down at, near San Antonio... Now, I, I'm not saying this to shock you, but I'm saying this from people that were there that did the investigating. This is what they said. You know, the, the conventional wisdom before these things started happening was to hide in place. If something like that starts happening, you hide. Well, now they're saying, no, you've got to evacuate. Get to the closest exit. Know where your exits are and get out. Because that man, when he got through shooting through the walls and he came into the building, he was going down and people were hunkered down under the pews and he's just like, and I'm, I'm not trying to sound flippant when I say it, but like shooting fish in a barrel. He said he took, and this breaks my heart, an 18-month-old child picked him up and shot him. Now somebody that can do that has allowed something to take over their mind. That's horrible. So don't, don't think what we're talking about this afternoon and what we've been talking about is not something that is real because it's real. And I also realize there are mental illnesses and I don't know all the details of that. So I don't know how all of that plays out, but I know this... We mentioned this earlier. The adage about a computer is garbage in, garbage out. And if I feed the wrong information into a computer, I'm going to get the wrong information coming out. I used to work in construction. And uh, I worked at a place we built roof trusses and floor trusses. And so uh, we would get sometimes the worksheets and it would tell us here's the angle that you need to cut on this particular board here's the length of it and all this and so then you would cut those boards and then when the men began to assemble those boards it didn't fit and so then they would send some one of the engineers down and look at it and they would say oh okay well you cut that board wrong and you'd go back and you'd check and you'd say no i I cut it just exactly like it says on the sheet. Well, the computer was wrong. And I'm like, no, you were wrong. <laughs> you fed the wrong information into that computer. But if you put the right information in, if the computer's working correctly, you put the right information in, you're going to get the right information out here, right? And so the very same thing applies to us. If we put the right information into our heart, and this is the Bible heart, if I put the right information into the Bible heart, then my life and my words and my actions 
are going to be in compliance with the Word of God. If I fill my mind with things that are bad and rotten and garbage, that's what's going to come out. So that's what I'm talking about when I say demons are real, Satan is real, they exist, and they do have power that we sometimes uh, fail to recognize. So I want to talk about, in the remainder of our time together this afternoon, I want to talk about the first terrorist. And I'm using that word uh, not to uh, be overly... uh, Uh, you know, surprising or something. We hear so much about terrorism now that uh, it's almost commonplace. But I want you to know that the devil, in reality, is the first terrorist. He is the devil. And I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 12, and I want you to look at how the Bible describes this individual that we're speaking of. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And as you're turning to the book of Revelation and you're getting to chapter 12, I will tell you right up front, and I know that Brother Ken believes this as well, that the book of Revelation is filled with symbolism and signs and figurative language. I understand that. But I want you to notice in the midst of all the figures of speech that John is going to use, I want you to notice the way are the words with which he describes the devil. And so we look at Revelation chapter 12, and we notice that in verse number 7, there was war in heaven. And brethren, that goes back to a verse of Scripture uh, that we talked about earlier in the book of Ephesians, and we were talking about how that we are battling uh, spiritual battles in heavenly places. Do you remember that? In, uh, in verse number 12 of Ephesians chapter 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against, now watch this, spiritual wickedness in high places. The brother read from the New King James. It says, heavenly places. So this war in heaven that John is describing is not the throne room of God. That's not the war. If I understand the picture, that's not the war he's describing. It is a great battle in these heavenly places that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6 and verse number 12. Be that as it may, notice what happens. Michael and his angels, now watch this, fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. And I want you to know they prevailed not. They did not win this battle. But I want you to think about the ferociousness of a dragon. I want you to get that mental picture in your mind. Can you imagine going toe to toe with a fire breathing dragon? Now that's the picture that we have of Satan. But I want you to know the Bible goes on and says that not only is he a great dragon, verse number 9, but yet I, I want you to notice that he is that old serpent. He's that old serpent. Now, we're going to talk more about this serpent in just a moment and what that entails. But I want you to think about the pictures of dragons that you've seen. Do you see how they are serpentine in nature that they have, uh, they, they have the look of a serpent? And so we're talking about a description of this power that is like a great dragon. He's that old serpent. Notice that he goes on to say in verse number 9, he's called the devil. And when you think about the word devil, you think about him being our adversary. He is Satan, it says. And he deceives, the Bible says, the whole world. He deceives the whole world. We're in verse number 9 of Revelation chapter 12. So he's called that dragon, that serpent, the devil, Satan, the deceiver. And the Bible even says that he is the great accuser of the brethren. John would tell us, In John chapter 12, and I want you to turn with me to John chapter 12. 
And I want you to notice the language that is recorded in John 12. And we want to notice uh, verse number 31. John 12 and verse number 31. Jesus said in verse 30, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now notice verse 31. Now, now is the judgment of this world. Now watch this. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So he is called by our Savior, the prince of this world. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we want to notice what the Apostle Paul says about the devil in verse number 4. He says, In whom the God of this world, now watch this, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto him. So he's called the prince of this world. He's called the God of this world. And as we read earlier this morning in 1 Peter 5, in verse number 8, he is called our adversary. So brethren, now... Having a description like we just described where you've got the dragon, the serpent, the devil, the deceiver of the world, the accuser of the brethren, we've got him being our adversary, I think we need to look at his tactics. How is he going to attack us? That's why we, de- we determined we're going to call this better understanding our adversary. We need to understand our adversary. Well, if we understand who he is, and I think we've given at least a pretty good description of who he is, then uh, we need to study his tactics. Isn't that what the military does? Find out who your enemy is, learn about your enemy, and then the next thing to do is to ask, okay, what kind of tactics does he use in battle? And so that's what we want to do for the remainder of our time. The Bible in Ephesians chapter 6 describes the things that the devil used as fiery darts. Fiery darts. Let's think about some of those fiery darts that the devil might throw at us. And I want to do this by going to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now we all know that in Genesis 3, in verse number 1, the Bible says now the serpent. And I, I want to talk about that word serpent for just a moment. It's popular for people to say that the devil took the form of a serpent. But that's not the description that we have here. He's called the serpent. We've already looked at Revelation chapter 12. This is not saying, if I understand right, that the devil somehow through demonic possession took over the body of an animal, a serpent, and then I read one brother and I thought this was interesting. He said that Satan was the the first ventriloquist. And he said that Satan, and that this is one of our own brethren who have written this, and I, I, I'm just like, okay, I, I, y'all remember the Twilight Zone? We, we've entered the Twilight Zone. But he actually claimed that the devil took a serpent. He said the devil was hiding behind a tree, and he cast his voice like a ventriloquist and made it look like a snake was talking. I don't know what book he was reading, but I got a pretty good guess. I know what book he wasn't reading because that's not what it says. It just enters in with the serpent. And the word there, the origin of that Hebrew word is very vague. They They don't know for sure where it comes from, but it has the idea of a hiss. You know, a hiss. And have you ever ever heard anybody trying to, 
if they're in a movie or something and they're trying to take on the, the voice of what they think a serpent would talk like, and they hiss, you know, everything's... So that's the word. We don't know exactly what all that word entails. But it's... The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So notice what he does. Brethren, and this is one of his most successful tactics in my mind. He throws doubt on the Word of God. He wants us to doubt the Word of God. That's the, that's the trick that he's throwing at us right here, isn't it? Well, did God say, and, I, and, I, and I've often, and I know, uh, I, I know most of us feel this way, I wish that we could hear the actual words as they were spoken. I, I in my mind, hear the Satan with a tone of sarcasm. Huh. Well, did God say? Did, you know, and so... I don't know if that's the way that it is. That's the way that I picture it in my mind. Well, did God say you shouldn't eat of every tree of the garden? And I want you to know in verse number 2, the woman said unto the serpent, and that's kind of strange too. <laughs> she just started talking. I'd be running, you know. I flee from the devil, but she hadn't got that memo yet. So she just starts talking to him. So a woman said, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but if the fruit of the trees or the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now in my mind there's something very interesting about Eve's response. God did not say in Genesis 2 not to touch that tree. He told Adam... In verse number 17 of Genesis 2, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. So Satan's tactic has already worked. He's already got Eve to thinking, and she's like, well, we can't even touch it. Well, God said don't eat of it. Now, we could debate all day the implication. Is that implying that you don't touch it? I, I don't know, but he said, don't eat of it. But Eve said that God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And then verse 4, Genesis 3 and verse 4, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You're not going to die. This is a scheme that God has dreamed up. That's what he's saying. Verse number 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, do you remember in 1 John 2, in verse 15, Love not the world, neither things in the world. You remember what he says in verse 16? The lust of the, fly, the, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Three areas in which Satan can attack us. Look at Genesis 3. What did she see? It was good for food. Lust of the flesh. Notice this, verse 6. It was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the eyes. So, you've got the lust of the eyes... Lust of the flesh, only thing missing is pride. Well, it's right there in verse 6. And a tree to be desired, desired, desired to make one wise. So she took of the fruit and did eat. Gave it to her husband also with her, and he did eat. Now, there's a lot of information there, but all I want us to know is that Dayton, uh, Satan, successfully use doubt to get at Eve and he'll do the same thing to you what about this you ever disappointed in someone
Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want you to know that Satan will use disappointment to trap you. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and notice verse number 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at not at things which are seen, but of things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When you think about disappointment, I look back over my life, and, and Brother Ken and I have reminisced about several gospel preachers that we've known in the past that have been great disappointments to us. They have done things that you would never dream that someone that you know and love and respect could, could do. But guess what? Preachers are human. Elders are human. Deacons are human. We're all human. We're all going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're all going to do things that disappoint someone else. But if our disappointment in a man motivates us to leave God then we never had our faith in God. We had our faith in a man. And men that you've known and I've known in the past that have been great godly men that we've loved and respect, they've gone on to their eternal reward and we hold them in very high esteem. But they were still men. And they were going to do things that are going to disappoint us. Brethren, we can never let the devil use disappointment to draw us away from God. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I left the church because brother so-and-so did such and such. Sister so-and-so said such and such, and I left the church. Well, why in the world would you leave God, would you leave Christ over something that a human being did that you know that human being is fallible, you know that human being is prone to sin, why are you allowing that to destroy your faith? brethren, but guess what? Isn't that exactly what Satan does to us? What's another one of his tactics? He gets us all discouraged. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, Elijah is a great prophet. But guess what? Elijah was uh, a lot like we are. Notice that it says, and I, I wish we had time to explore the background. You know this. Uh, Jezebel is out to try to kill uh, Elijah. And so Elijah flees into the wilderness. And in verse 13, it was so when Elijah... 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 13. When Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? What did God say? What are you doing here, Elijah? What, what, what are you doing? So verse 14, he says, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword and I, even I, only am left. Now what is that, brethren? Well, that's discouragement on an epic scale. I mean, you even read psychologists that read these accounts and they diagnose him as a manic depressive at this point. I, I, I don't... I don't think you can uh, make that kind of judgment out somebody you haven't talked to and you haven't known. But I do know this. He was discouraged. And he's like, I'm the only one left, God. Everybody else, they're either dead or they've gone and they've started serving idols. And I'm the only one that's here. That's why it's called the Elijah Syndrome. Oh, I, I'm the only faithful child of God left. We sometimes think in a congregation of God's people, 
Well, I'm the only one that's left. I'm the only one that's fighting. I'm the only one that's working. I'm the, I'm the, and we go on and on and on. And so Elijah said, look, God, I'm the only one left in verse 14. And they seek my life to take it away. They're trying to kill me. I'm the only one left, God, and they're trying to kill me. And the Lord said unto him in verse 15, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And, 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 and I'm not going to read all of this. But Elijah is to the point of discouragement to the sense that he's like, God, I wish I was dead. Well, don't you know that Satan was jumping for joy right there? He is taken a great man of God and through the process of discouragement has got him to the point where he says, I'm the only one left, God, and they're trying to kill me. Now, make that application in your life, in your family. Our family, going back to what we talked about a moment ago, disappoints us, right? And we, and we get to the point where we're, well, I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's left. Not so. Death is another tool that Satan uses to discourage us. In Revelation chapter 14, there's a fascinating statement made by John the Revelator. He says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 13 that he heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Brethren, for the faithful child of God, death is a blessing. When a faithful child of God dies, they are now in a better place. So why would we let death drive a wedge between us and God? I've often told, I, I know uh, years ago I, I was uh, talking to a man. He was not a member of the Lord's church. And he had three sons. And all three of his sons, two of them died in an automobile accident as a result of driving under the influence. And then one committed suicide. So within the period of two years, he lost all his children. And he was very discouraged. I, I thought to the point that he might even be considering so his brother asked me to go talk to him. So I went to David at the funeral or at the visitation of the last son and uh, went to the uh, funeral home. I couldn't think of it. And I go in, I said, Where, where's David? You know, And they said, well, he's out by the truck. And man, he's in a bad way. So I went to him and I said, uh, David, uh, you know, I'm sorry. I don't have words to express. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He said, why did God take my sons? And I said, David, I don't know how else to say this except to let you know God didn't take your sons. Death is from the devil and it's not from God. And your sons died because they made choices that were out of what God would be pleased with. Everybody thought, you idiot, because there were several men that were standing around at this time. They thought, you've done it. And so I left, I went back in, I was talking to his brother, uh, and David came in, and John went over and started talking to him, and he came back in a few minutes, he said, what did you say to David? And I told him what I said. And he goes, well, it worked. It worked. We baptized David and his wife within a month of that. Brethren, don't, don't let people tell you God 
took your child. God took your mother, your father, your brother, your wife. Because that's of the devil. That's where death comes from, not from God. And I think sometimes, brethren, we need to really lovingly, kindly explain to people when they make statements like that the truth of the matter. But don't allow the devil to take death and discourage you to the point that you're going to leave the cause of Christ. And so we've looked at spiritual warfare and it's my desire and my prayer that in looking through these three lessons that I have helped you, that I have pointed out to you that we are at war, that we are fighting a spiritual battle, that God is victorious, and we have an enemy in Satan who is crafty, who uses all kinds of schemes. But brethren, I want you to go back to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want you to notice again, we've already looked at it several times in our study, but I want you to notice this. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, watch this. Whom resist, did you see that? Resist, now watch this, steadfast. That means the devil's going to keep coming, and he's going to keep coming, and he's going to keep coming, and you've got to keep standing, and you've got to keep standing, and you've got to keep standing, and you've got to know his tactics. But he says, resist steadfast in the faith. Why? Why? knowing that the same afflictions, did you hear that, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We get this attitude, I'm the only one, like Elijah, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. Brethren, everybody here has had a family member die. Everybody here has been sick. Everybody here has been touched by divorce by cancer, by all these things that are not of God, that are of the devil. We've been touched by those things, but we have a loving, tender, compassionate Heavenly Father who Paul says is the God of all comfort, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want us to know that the God that we serve is victorious. And that if we are on God's side, we'll be victorious. No matter how dark the cloud may seem, no matter how deep the water may feel, God is there, He's real, and He will help us. So that's kind of been the thought process. I hope it helps. And I want you to know this afternoon, if you're not a child of God, you can whip the devil. You take this book, and it's like some of the songs that we sang. The gates of hell quiver when God's people shout for praise. The devil cowers when God's people stand up. And so as God's people, let's pick up the banner and let's march as soldiers of Christ. And let's go out and conquer the city of Garland. Let's go out and conquer the city of uh, Dallas. Let's go out and conquer the state of Texas. Let's conquer the United States. Let's be like those in the first century that when they got there, they said, those that have turned the world upside down, they've come here too. Brethren, that's what we've got to get back to. That's what we've got to do as God's people. Don't let the devil distract you. Don't let the devil get disappointment and all these things that he throws at you and get you away. So this evening, this afternoon, if you're a child of God, and you've allowed Satan to get the upper hand in your life. You've got brothers and sisters that love you. And they're more than happy to pray for you and pray with you. And so uh, in just a moment, we're going to be singing an invitation song. And we're pleading with you to come forward. Let us help you. James would say, 
that we are to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another. That's what we want to do this afternoon. And as someone who's not a child of God, we want you to know that God loves you. We want you to know that the devil, uh, he claims to love you, but all he wants is your soul and power over you. And God has given us a plan whereby we can overcome the devil. If you're not a Christian, just believe the Word of God. Repent of the sins that you have in your life. Confess that Jesus is the Christ and be baptized. And he'll add you to the church, his family, his kingdom, his ark of safety, his ark of his city of refuge. And so if you've never obeyed the gospel, when we sing this song or as a child of God, if you have a need, please come while we stand and while we sing.